Good evening, and welcome to St. Jerome's University. My name is Peter Meehan. I'm the President and Vice Chancellor, and it's my great privilege to welcome you all here tonight for our first lecture in Catholic experience. Before I introduce our speaker, um, I would like to offer a land acknowledgement. And before I do that, I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of the members of our first Indigenous Advisory Circle at St. Jerome's who are here with us today. They have not met yet as a group, but they graciously came, met with Archbishop Bolin, and are beginning their journey here at St. Jerome's to understand more about us and to help us in our efforts with reconciliation. So we acknowledge with respect that St. Jerome's University and the University of Waterloo reside and operate on the traditional territory of the Atawandaran, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee peoples. Our university is situated on the Haldeman Tract, the land Frederick Haldeman granted to the Haudenosaunee of the Six Nations of the Grand River in 1784 that includes 10 kilometers on both sides of the Grand River and extends from its source to Lake Erie. We give thanks for the privilege to work and live on this land, and we are committed to building respectful relationships with Indigenous people and communities to enhance our knowledge and to learn how we can live, excuse me, have an active role in reconciliation. The lectures in Catholic experience at St. Jerome's University have been in existence since 1982. In fact, their founder is with us today, Michael Higgins. Since 1982, St. Jerome's has offered these to our local community, providing opportunities for us to engage with the critical issues of our time. We've invited scholars, activists, experts, and religious leaders to address subjects in the areas of religion and politics, spirituality, healthcare, international relations and human rights, ecological responsibility, religious pluralism, ecumenism, interfaith dialogue, religion, and the media, among others. This year's theme for the lectures, Legacies and Lessons, confronts themes including the increasing gap between rich and poor, the importance of equity, diversity, and inclusion, sustainability and its implications for the very future of our planet, and justice for and reconciliation with Indigenous people. Our hope is that the program of speakers we've engaged this year will allow us to explore, challenge, and walk our own synodal path to see the importance of encounter and dialogue, and to understand the need for changes in both the church and the world that will be meaningful and lasting. Now something about our speaker. During his visit to Canada last July, Pope Francis was pressed to repudiate the so-called doctrine of discovery, the 15th century papal bulls which gave European powers the justification to take new territories so that they could be turned into Christian lands. In a joint statement in March, Canadian Cardinal Michael Cherney, Prefect of the Vatican's Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development, announced that the doctrine of discovery is not part of the teachings of the Catholic Church. And at the same time, the Church acknowledges that these papal bulls did not adequately reflect the equal dignity and rights of indigenous peoples. The church is also aware that the contents of these documents were manipulated for political purposes by competing colonial powers in order to justify immoral acts against indigenous peoples. This evening's talk, The Wounds of the Past, Truth-Telling and a Future of Hope, The Doctrine of Discovery and the Path to Reconciliation, will situate the church's contemporary response to the papal bulls of the 15th century, which provided moral justification for colonizing powers to claim as their own lands which had long been inhabited by indigenous peoples within the context of the challenge of addressing sinful actions from within the church in the past. It will explore what the recent Vatican statement on the doctrine of discovery said and didn't say and how it has been received. And it will reflect on the larger work of reconciliation and the challenge of proclaiming and being faithful to the gospel in a context where wounds from the past continue to impact present relations. Donald Bolin is the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Regina, Saskatchewan. 
He was born on Treaty 4 territory in Gravelberg, Saskatchewan. After graduate studies and ordination to the priesthood, he taught in the Religious Studies Department at Campion College at the University of Regina and engaged in parish ministry. In 2001, he was appointed to work at the Vatican's Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity, serving the Catholic Church's international dialogues with Anglicans and Methodists. He was named the Bishop of the Diocese of Saskatoon in 2010 and Archbishop of Regina in 2016. Within the Canadian Catholic uh, for, uh, for Conference, uh, excuse me, Canadian Conference for Catholic Bishops, he has been active in ecumenical and justice work. On both diocesan and national levels, he has been actively involved in Indigenous relations and responding to the calls uh, to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. He was a member of the Bishop's Working Group that worked on the Indigenous delegation that went to Rome in March 2022 and the Pope's visit to Canada in July 2022. Please join me now in welcoming Archbishop Donald Bolin. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, thank you very much to St. Jerome's for the invitation to be here. Uh, it's the second time I've had the privilege of, uh, of speaking here and uh, very honored to be here. It was good to hear your, your land acknowledgement as well. I come from Treaty 4 territory, the Archdiocese of Regina is uh, on the territories of the Nehawak, the Nakwe, and the Nakota peoples, and the homeland of uh, Dakota, Lakota, and Métis peoples. Uh, it's good to be uh, in dialogue with you on this land. Uh, I'm very mindful that uh, it would be good to be giving this uh, lecture, this presentation, with an Indigenous co-presenter uh, from home. Um, we have a working principle uh, in our truth and reconciliation work of nothing about us without us. Uh, but academic uh, lectures kind of move us out of that mode somewhat. But I, I would acknowledge at the outset the, the very wise elders, uh, knowledge keepers, uh, survivors that I have the privilege of, of walking with and working with uh, back home and uh, my indebtedness to them. So I, uh, this is the, the topic which Dr. Meehan read out, and I want to just uh, go over the outline briefly with you um, so you know what's ahead, and I'm going to try to wrap up in somewhere between 45 and 50 minutes so you know that even though the topic is such that we could, this is a big topic, <laughs> this is a big topic that we're, we're not going to be able to go fully into the depths of, but um, here's the here's the plan really in three parts. The first part uh, to talk about the issue that we're seeking to address, to unpack it a little, framed within the context of colonization, the impact of col colonization, which led to the Indian Act, the residential schools. Uh, as articulated in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, the Church's statements more recently, especially Pope Francis on colonization, and then to look at the, the notion of doctrine of discovery as it appears in the Truth and Reconciliation uh, final report in Call to Action 49, uh, and to look at the, the papal bulls that were alluded to, to look at uh, the place where the language of the principle of discovery is first used, which is in an 1823 legal case in the United States. So that's all part one, really laying the, the landscape. Part two will be to look at the church's efforts uh, to address uh, the doctrine of discovery and respond to call to action 49 in Canada and a more broad request to engage in this, looking first at a statement of the uh, Catholic bishops directly in response to call to action 49 issued in 2016 and then to look at and really try to unpack this statement that came from the Holy See on March 30th of this year. Uh, as was said, what it says, what it doesn't say, what the media think it's, thinks it said uh, and uh, 
Part three, the last couple of pieces are really, where do we go from here? And uh, as you'll see, the, both Canadian and American bishops in their accompanying statement, uh, when the Holy See's statement was issued, uh, spoke about the, the possibility and value of organizing a symposium, and perhaps a series of symposia, with Indigenous and non-Indigenous historians uh, to deepen the conversation. So where does the conversation go from here? What are the things that need to be unpacked, further researched, discussed, and acted upon? So we'll just touch on that and really, I hope, open up in the period of uh, Q&A uh, some engagement from yourselves on this uh, very important topic. So it's, a, it's an ambitious outline. Um, hopefully, uh, for those of you who are already well read on the topic, uh, there will be some pertinent information and some avenues of conversation that we can pick up on. Uh, for those of you who don't have much background in this area, uh, but perhaps saw a CBC story or a Globe and Mail story on it, uh, to give you a broader introduction uh, to the topic. It's, it's about texts and it's about history. <laughs> and so it's not really simple territory. Um, and, uh, you know, I do, I do have some sympathy for uh, journalists who don't have training in history or theology per se and who are trying to grasp the nuance of uh, statements, especially the statement that comes out of the Holy See. So I will be a little bit uh, critical of the misinterpretations. It's, this is not easy territory to, uh, to work with or to unpack. So uh, to situate the discussion, we're having this conversation not as a culture and as church, not principally for the sake of doing history. We're having this conversation because of the legacy of colonization, uh, which we still live with today. Indigenous peoples here and in many parts of the world lost their rights, they lost their way of living on the land, their culture, traditions, languages, and much, much more during the period of colonization and that has decisively shaped their history ever since. Today, following the, the truth and reconciliation process, we are trying to come to terms with that history and discern steps forward. Uh, 10 days ago, just about two weeks ago, I attended an event uh, uh, in Regina organized by Kisiku's First Nation on truth-telling and they had a they had a banner up at the front and uh, words that called for truth-telling and some of those words pertain to the past uh, residential schools uh, the Indian Act uh, but many of the words pertain to current challenges. Uh, so we saw on that banner health issues, intergenerational trauma, homelessness, addictions, incarceration, racism, suicides. It's important to name, and that truth-telling gathering named, that this is the legacy of colonization and the Indian Act and the residential school system, effort to assimilate indigenous peoples to disenfranchise them. So the discussion about the doctrine of discovery arises out of the present as much as it arises in seeking clarity about the past. And it begins, I think, by asking, how did we get into this situation? What happened? What happened at the time of colonization? How did the colonial enterprise and taking of indigenous lands and lands that were inhabited by indigenous peoples for millennia, uh, how, how, did, how did that get justified? And who's responsible and who needs to apologize and what can we do about it now, right? In many ways, those and similar questions were at the heart of the truth and reconciliation process, a process which uh, certainly took me to school. 
which I think took the Canadian population who attended to it to school. Uh, we had a narrative of history, uh, an understanding of the narrative of what Canada was as a nation that was deeply impoverished, profoundly diminished, and hadn't paid attention to the waves of suffering of indigenous peoples. So the TRC process allowed us to hear for many, for the first time, those waves of suffering and the sources of so much suffering and the various kinds of abuse that were experienced in residential schools. The TRC calls to action are uh, a roadmap for a new way of walking together, for building right relations. And it's one of those calls to action, call to action 49, that provides a, a starting point for us and we'll be turning to that momentarily. In preparation for this evening and maybe for the <laughs> fifth time, I, I reread the, the start of the, the TRC summary volume. Uh, the opening pages of that document uh, are so powerful and such a profound entry point into the legacy of residential schools and more broadly, the legacy of colonization. And they, they offer and point to a desire for right relationship and a way of walking together in a, in a good way. We often think of reconciliation as, heal whoops, as healing a, a healthy relationship that's gone wrong. But near the start of that, uh, oh, sorry, somehow that got lost. Near the start of that uh, TRC summary document, uh, we read that this really healthy relationship between indigenous peoples and European settlers uh, who came to this land is something of a, of a myth. So early on in that document, you read, to some people, reconciliation is the reestablishment of a conciliatory state. However, this is a state that many Aboriginal people assert never has existed between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people. And the text goes on to, to frame the legacy of residential schools within the context of colonization. Reconciliation must support Aboriginal peoples as they heal from the destructive legacies of colonization that have re wreaked such havoc on their lives. This situation holds true in many other parts of the world as well, where indigenous peoples were deeply impacted in a negative way by colonization. Pope Francis has been strong on this topic. And uh, it was when he was in Bolivia in 2015, addressing a gathering of popular movements there fighting for for justice, that he uh, issued the first statement that I saw from him on colonization uh, that was uh, very strong. Now I have the challenge that I can't, if I start talking, reading a quote and it's not what's on your screen, you, you flag me or something, but I think I got this one right here. <laughs> so um, where the Pope said, I say to this to you with regret, many grave sins were committed against the native peoples of America in the name of God. Like St. John Paul II, I ask that the church, I repeat what he said, kneel before God and implore forgiveness for the past and present sins of her sons and daughters. I humbly ask forgiveness, not only for the offenses of the church herself, but also for the crimes committed against the native peoples during the so-called conquest of America. I remember uh, one of uh, my indigenous friends, uh, she's, a, she's an activist and she was, she was present there as a Canadian representative in Bolivia. And she talked about just how, I mean, he was reading a text and then all of a sudden he seemed to depart from the text. And then when he, when he said this, she said, uh, there was just a, a deep resonance among those who were gathered, that this was a word that needed to be said. Uh, 
So it, it wasn't a surprise that when um, with uh, close consultation with uh, uh, the AFN, with the ITK, with the MNC, the three national bodies of uh, First Nation, Métis and Inuit peoples, uh, we organized a, a, a delegation to go see Pope Francis in Rome at the end of March and the first day of April in 2022. It, it, it wasn't surprising to us when the Pope, uh, in speaking to those delegations, after hearing them in separate meetings with each of them and listening to what they said, uh, addressed that issue. So uh, does that quote start with the chain? Yep, okay. The chain that passed on knowledge and ways of life in union with the land was broken by a colonization that lacked respect for you, tore many of you from your vital milieu, and tried to conform you to another mentality. In this way, great harm was done to your identity and your culture. Many families were separated and great numbers of children fell victim to these attempts to impose a uniformity based on the notion that progress occurs through ideological colonization. It was at the end of that visit on April 1st that Pope Francis indicated that he would be coming to Canada in July of last year. He had offered an apology to indigenous peoples of this land in Rome, but the TRC call to action 58 asked that the Pope would come here and extend that apology. He did extend that apology on several occasions during his visit to this land. And the first of those apologies uh, was on his first major stop at Masquachis, uh, the First Nation uh, south of Edmonton, First Nation that uh, uh, TRC Commissioner Chief Wilton Littlechild comes from. Now, uh, I'm gonna put just one part of his apology there on the screen. Uh, and I invite you to note how the apology contextualizes the Indian residential schools within the broader framework of colonization and the long-standing effort and intent to assimilate, assimilate indigenous peoples into European ways of, of being in the world and living on the land. So he says, I am here because the first step of my penitential pilgrimage among you is that of, again, asking forgiveness, of telling you once more that I am deeply sorry Sorry for the ways in which regrettably many Christians supported the colonizing mentality of the powers that oppress the indigenous peoples. I am sorry I ask forgiveness in particular for the ways in which many members of the church and of religious communities cooperated, not least through their indifference, in projects of cultural destruction and forced assimilation promoted by the governments of that time, which cul culminated in the system of residential schools. One of the most important sentences, I would think, of Pope Francis's visit and of his address in Mascochis was acknowledging the catastrophic impact of the residential school system on indigenous people and communities. The first of these uh, references here is, is, uh, is dense. Although Christian charity was not absent, and there were many outstanding instances of devotion and care for children, the overall effects of the policies linked to the residential schools were catastrophic. That is a very, very strong word which acknowledges all those waves of suffering that he heard about. In Quebec, he says that history of suffering and contempt, the fruit of the colonizing mentality does not heal easily. So I want to frame the conversation about doctrine of discovery within that larger framework, within the lens of uh, colonization. With that in mind, uh, here is call to action 49. We call upon all religious denominations and faith groups who have not already done so to repudiate concepts used to justify European sovereignty over indigenous lands and peoples, such as the doctrine of discovery, 
and terra nullius. At the outset, it's important to note that uh, this call to action provides, if not, if not a, a definition, a, at least a categorizing of what it means when it speaks of doctrine of discovery. A, a concept used to justify European sovereignty over indigenous lands and peoples. It's taking us to the heart uh, of the deeply problematic outcome where indigenous peoples lost their rights, lost their lands. Uh, terra nullius, uh, terra net land nullius, basically no one, no one's land. The fact that indigenous peoples lived on lands for thousands of years because they didn't live on them in a European way, didn't claim ownership of the land, which has its own right, uh, problematic human constructs, right? they were perceived as somehow available to the invading uh, uh, countries. Now, the term doctrine needs to be uh, unpacked a, a little here. Uh, doctrines have a particular meaning in the world of the church. Uh, so when we speak about faith communities repudiating doctrines, uh, we can get a wrong understanding of what was being asked here. Um, when we speak about doctrines in a Catholic sense, in the first instance, we speak about incarnation. We speak about Paschal mystery. Uh, we speak about Christ's presence in the Eucharist. Um, uh, we don't speak, per se, about church policy regarding other nations as, as doctrine. So anyway, we do well to ask, and this is a key point for historical research going forward, right? Where does the phrase doctrine of discovery come from? In a few minutes, we're gonna look at this series of deeply troubling papal documents from the late 15th, early 16th centuries. But these papal bulls don't use the language of doctrine in that regard. A more apt place for us to look is to the US legal system, and in the first instance to a court case uh, the case of Johnson versus McIntosh, which coincidentally, uh, that ruling came down exactly 200 years ago in 1823. Um, so, uh, oh, um, so this is the, if you go to the internet and you search it up, that's the first thing you'll, you'll find here. Now, um, this, uh, this is a case that was about uh, a, a conflict between two people who claimed ownership of, of land that had once been indigenous land, and the court case was really about the right of indigenous people to sell land that had been theirs, that they had occupied and lived upon for centuries. And uh, the court case ended up ruling no. They do not have that right. This is crown land. This is uh, well, not crown land, it's the United States, but it's <laughs> government land, right? So uh, this is uh, a, a couple of excerpts here, and again, I apologize for all the texts you're gonna have in front of you, but this is the raw data of this conversation, right? Um, so it's helpful to look at some of the explanation for that judgment which lays out the rationale for its decision and makes reference to the legal principle of discovery. So, on the discovery of this immense continent, I should say right at the start, this, this ruling should make you angry. <laughs> so, um, I, I'm not putting it up here because it's a, a good thing. Um, uh, maybe not as angry as the papal bulls that you're about to see. Uh, on the discovery of this immense continent, the great nations of Europe were eager to appropriate to themselves so much of it as they could respectively acquire. But as they were all in pursuit of nearly the same object, it was necessary in order to avoid conflicting settlements and consequent war with each other to establish a principle which all should acknowledge as the law by which the right of acquisition, which they all asserted, should be regulated as between themselves. <laughs> 
This principle was that discovery gave title to the government by whose subjects or by whose authority it was made against all other European governments, which title might be consummated by possession. And this, there's a, a little bit of reference to Indians in this document, which suggests they have the right to continue to live on these lands, uh, but not to own them. So, uh, and when that in itself was not a right, which was really granted. Okay, so the other part of this quotation here. In the establishment of these relations, the rights of the original inhabitants were in no instance entirely disregarded, but were necessarily to a considerable extent impaired. That's an understatement. Their power to dispose of the soil at their own will, to whomsoever they pleased, was denied by the original fundamental principle that discovery gave exclusive title to those who made it. Of course, today, um, indigenous and non-indigenous scholars would take issue with this ruling and the argumentation behind it. Uh, but the argument laid out here uh, from which the language of doctrine of discovery stems, right? is that there was an agreement among nations, a sort of legal doctrine commonly accepted, that colonizing nations had the right to claim title to land that they discovered, quote unquote, discovered, of course, land which had been occupied by indigenous peoples for millennia. Call to Action 49 challenges precisely that, that attitude under whatever name of the European claim to be able to take as their own indigenous lands. Now, of course, the Catholic Church comes into the conversation because a series of papal bulls, declarations, uh, were issued at the time, at the initial period of, of colonization. And this was a time when uh, there was a, a Vatican state, uh, a significant piece of territory that was under the, the, the rule of the Vatican. So the Pope was, uh, not only the head of the church offices and structures, but also of a significant piece of land. And the, the church was part of a, the political landscape in a way that's very different from today. These papal bulls that we're going to look at were issued in part to keep peace between different Christian nations, Catholic nations, who were engaging in colonial expansion the bulls were in part intended to ask them to bring Christian faith with them as they expanded their empires. The language of these bulls is difficult to hear for us today. Um, you've probably seen excerpts in the media. Um, so um, the first of these bulls that I'd like to address, Dum de Versis, comes from uh, 1452. And uh, it's addressed to the king of Portugal as Portugal was expanding into West Africa. So we grant you by these present documents with our apostolic authority, full and free permission to invade, search out, capture, and subjugate the Saracens and pagans and any other unbelievers and enemies of Christ, wherever they may be, as well as their kingdoms, duchies, counties, principalities, and other property, and to reduce their persons into perpetual servitude. Um, papal bull that pertains directly to the Americas, addressed to the king of Spain, but, uh, and also uh, about the relationship between Spain and Portugal as colonizing powers, uh, uh, is inter cetera uh, from 1493. So Columbus, uh, you know the little rhyme, Sailed the ocean blue in 1492, so this is 1493. Uh, Should any of the said islands have been found by your envoys and captains, give grant and assign to you and your heirs and successors, this is the Spanish kings of Castile and Leon, all rights, jurisdictions, and appurtenances, all islands and mainlands found and to be found, discovered and to be discovered, towards the west and the south by drawing and establishing a line from the Arctic Pole, namely the north, to the Antarctic Pole, namely the south, the said line to be distant 100 leagues towards the west and south from any of the islands commonly known as the Azores. Okay. So 
the Holy See is, uh, the Pope at that time has uh, taken it upon himself then to designate. The Spanish can invade and conquer up to here and the Portuguese from this point onwards. Uh, now, um, there are uh, other papal bulls that again are asserting a similar authority or guidelines. Um, in 1537, um, at this point, um, some missionaries, and most notably Bartolomé de las Casas, uh, writes to the Pope saying that uh, these bulls are being misused, that the uh, colonizing powers are treating indigenous peoples terribly, uh, that these peoples have real values and, and rights, and that the church needs to intervene. That's my quick summary of the message of Bartolome de las Casas. But in 1437, uh, 1537 here, so it's not a statement written in today's language, uh, but we see a huge shift here. We define and declare that the said Indians and all other people who may later be discovered by Christians are by no means to be deprived of their liberty or the possession of their property even though they be outside the Christian faith, and that they may and should freely and legitimately enjoy their liberty and possession of their property, nor should they in any way be in any way enslaved. Should the contrary happen, it shall be null and have no effect. Um, so from an ecclesial sense, from a, a church sense, um, the, the papal bulls have been replaced by this point. Um, it's not the language of, of repudiated, right? But it's a change in political policy. It's a change in instruction to other nations. And uh, so the church moves to a different stance and starts a tradition of, of defending rights of indigenous peoples. But, um, now, I wanna take us back to our present context and uh, to call to action 49. Um, so, uh, I think somehow my slideshow should have a couple of photos. So before we go here, I'm looking for a couple of pictures. There we go. Um, you probably saw this. Uh, in the news. So this was at uh, uh, St. Anne de Beaupre when Pope Francis was there and the clear call to for the Pope during the course of his visit, uh, not only to uh, apologize for Catholic engagement in a project of assimilation in residential schools, not all, only to apologize for the various kinds of abuse that were suffered in those schools, but also to address those papal bulls. Uh, so rescind the doctrine. And, no, let's see, there should have been a, sorry. Uh, there's the other one. Uh, that was inside the basilica. And by virtue of where I was in the procession, the, the purple zucchetto on the left-hand side is my head. <laughs> so um, anyway, um, so uh, there was a, a desire for the for the Pope to, uh, I'm gonna get to this passage, this part in a minute here, uh, a, a desire for the Pope to address uh, the papal bulls. Uh, the Canadian Catholic Church, so call to action 49 called on faith communities in Canada to address the doctrine of discovery and terra nullius and the Canadian Bishops Conference at that time uh, wanted to engage in a response um, and yet it wasn't for the CCCB uh, or the Catholic Church in Canada to address the papal bulls. Uh, so uh, we, we wanted to speak not just as bishops on this question, but the, the whole Catholic Church in Canada for it to, to respond. So we created, a, 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 uh, as it were, a, a, a circle, a commission, a circle called the Guadalupe Circle. And it had bishops, and I was on it at that time. 
and uh, it had, you know, Catholic Women's League and Knights of Columbus and St. Vincent de Paul and representatives from different Catholic bodies and structures uh, so that we could speak in some way uh, on behalf of the Catholic Church in Canada more comprehensively than just a statement, and that's not just a statement, but a statement by bishops alone. Um, and uh, we had a deadline <laughs> by which we were requested to uh, make a response. So the 2016 statement from the Bishops Conference uh, said the following, uh, we firmly assert that indigenous people created in the image and likeness of God our Creator should have been granted all fundamental human rights in the past as in the present, and that any reducing of their humanity and fundamental human rights past or present is to be resisted in the strongest possible way. We reject the assertion that the ancient principle of the first taker or discoverer, often described by the term terra nullius, could be applied to lands in the prior possession of indigenous peoples. We reject the assertion that the mere absence of European agricultural practices, technologies, or other aspects common to European culture could justify the claiming of land as if it had no owner. We reject the assertion that Europeans could determine whether land was used or possessed by indigenous people without consulting those people. It was a start. Um, it was a start, and there was a little bit of an uptake in response from uh, indigenous nations and communities and, and scholars, but not a, not a lot of response and not a lot of engagement. And, and of course, it didn't address the, the, the papal bulls. Uh, so during the course of the Pope's visit, uh, the request came, and I guess that's why I had those images after here, uh, for the Pope to strongly address the, the issue. And uh, it was announced through the media spokesperson at the CCCB that uh, the Holy See was in dialogue uh, with bishops conferences, including the Canadian Bishops Conference, on uh, how to address uh, the doctrine of discovery and in the process to address the, the papal bulls. And uh, that document came out on March 30th of this year. So uh, I want to highlight uh, the most central paragraph and then to identify some of the things that that statement does and uh, what, it, what it doesn't do. So uh, here we go. The doctrine of discovery is not part of the teaching of the Catholic Church. It's not a doctrine. Uh, the, the, those papal bulls did not articulate Catholic doctrine. Historical research clearly demonstrates that the papal documents in question, written in a specific historical period and linked to political questions, have never been considered expressions of the Catholic faith. At the same time, the Church acknowledges that these papal bulls did not adequately reflect the equal dignity and rights of indigenous peoples. The Church is also aware that the contents of these documents were manipulated for political purposes by competing colonial powers in order to justify immoral acts against Indigenous peoples that were carried out at times without opposition from ecclesiastical authorities. It is only just to recognize these errors, acknowledge the terrible effects of the assimilation policies and the pain experienced by Indigenous peoples, and ask for pardon. Furthermore, Pope Francis has urged, and this is a quote from when he was here in Canada, never again can the Christian community allow itself to be infected by the idea that one culture is superior to others, or that it is legitimate to employ ways of coercing others. So, uh, that statement, uh, does several things. It affirms the rights and dignity of indigenous peoples. Uh, and it's not in the quote here, but in the larger document. It calls on the church to actively uh, support those rights. It acknowledges the great suffering of indigenous people as a result of colonization and efforts at assimilation. It acknowledges that the papal bulls 
did not respect the rights of indigenous peoples. It asked pardon, recognizing also that the bulls were used in problematic ways by colonial powers. And towards the end of that document, the last paragraph, which you haven't seen here, it points to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as a guide for the pursuit of justice and a framework for standing in solidarity with Indigenous Peoples. So uh, there was a, a range of responses uh, to this uh, statement. Um, the, the, the common misunderstanding, I guess, is that uh, the Catholic Church had a doctrine which it revoked because it doesn't see these statements as doctrinal statements. But it does definitely distance itself from those statements, acknowledge their problematic character, and, and apologize. Um, it's rightly understood in the context of many other statements of Pope Francis which point to indigenous ways of living in relation to the land and all creation as a source of wisdom that the world desperately needs to listen to and learn from. Um, the, uh, the, there were some very good comments and responses and uh, Chief Roseanne Archibald, national chief at that time, who sometimes makes some pretty harsh statements regarding the church, it, it called this a small step on a long journey and I thought that was one of the most concise and accurate uh, responses. Uh, many indigenous leaders, uh, including Chief Wilton Littlechild and Graydon Nicholas and Phil Fontaine, uh, you know, said this is a really important step um, and we've been asking for it for a long time. I don't think anybody said this solves the issue, <laughs> this covers it, this, this brings an end to that conversation. Um, so, given, given that this was a step, uh, a needed step, um, where do we go from here? The, the Canadian Bishops' Conference was very mindful, uh, as was the American Bishops' Conference with whom we were in dialogue through this whole process, uh, that the conversation needed to go on and that there were scholarly questions that needed to be asked and addressed and researched um, and proposed the idea uh, of a symposium. So here's the statement. Oh, sorry. I'm back to Johnson and Macintosh here. Okay, <laughs> let, me, let me follow my slide presentation. I'll get to the other in a moment. Um, the Johnson versus McIntosh case does address the papal bulls, uh, but does suggest, I'll, I'll just let you read it, but that Spain was not fundamentally motivated uh, by the papal bulls, but by their desire to expand, as was the case with other colonizing powers. So one of the critical historical questions uh, that needs to be addressed is, to what, ex to what extent did those papal bulls impact colonizing powers? To what extent were they driven by them? To what extent were they driven principally by their desire to expand, to become more powerful? And to what extent were those papal bulls used uh, by them to give moral justification to their actions? Uh, and how much historical research is out there in that regard? So I think that's a, that's a big question. So now, um, maybe I don't, don't have, I either missed it or anyway, let me read you the statement from the Canadian bishops, a uh, statement that went alongside uh, the publication of the, the Vatican statement in March. The CCCB, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, and the Pontifical Committee for Historical Sciences are together exploring the possibility of or organizing an academic symposium with indigenous and non-indigenous scholars to further deepen historical understanding about the doctrine of discovery. This idea of a symposium has likewise received encouragement from the two dicasteries that issued today's statement. That was the dicastery for integral human development headed by Cardinal Michael Cherney from here and uh, the 
yeah, dicastery for culture. So if we are going to go into a symposium or perhaps a series of symposia because the issues to be discussed are significant, what are the critical questions to ask? And I think a first one has to do with the role that the papal bulls played in the decisions of colonizing powers. And what documentation do we have of the internal discernment process in Spain, in Portugal, in England, in France, as they undertook uh, to engage in colonization? Uh, so there's a, a network of questions that are precisely about the 15th and 16th centuries. Then there's a, a key question, of which much has been written, but much needs to be reflected upon. What is the ongoing impact of colonization, of the taking of indigenous lands? To what extent uh, was the doctrine of discovery, was the judgment in Johnson versus McIntosh, is it, to what extent is it now embedded in American law? To what extent is it embedded in Canadian law? To what extent is it embedded in systemic injustice towards indigenous peoples? Uh, that's a big question and it opens to uh, the question, what should we do then? How do we need to be engaged? So. Uh, there's a big question about what we as society need to do and what governments need to do. I'm going to steer clear of that one here. Um, but I think rightfully ask, what can the church do? And what can the academic community do? Because many of you work in that academic context. Um, what can the church do? Well, I think hosting the symposia and furthering the conversation is key. Uh, but ongoing solidarity with indigenous people in the pursuit of justice is really central. Uh, using the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the Truth, of Recon Truth and Reconciliation calls to action as a blueprint for solidarity. I was with the lead of indigenous people too long. The churches and society as a whole have come up with ideas and said, here's what we're gonna do to help you, and that's never been very workable, right? But to take the lead of indigenous people and find out how we can stand in solidarity uh, in the pursuit of justice as it is experienced or as injustice is experienced in all dimensions of our society. What can the academy do? Uh, I wanna come back to where I started about the truth telling. Uh, Truth-telling is hard work. Uh, human beings are complex, societies are complex. Um, and uh, so we had a narrative about Canada that was very deficient. It didn't pay attention to indigenous voices, it didn't pay attention to indigenous experience. Today, we're listening to those voices, at least beginning to listen to those voices and taking them seriously. But I think it's important for the academic community to, to take seriously its role in the doing of history, in the rethinking and retelling in an appropriate and responsible way of what happened at the time of colonization, what happened with the Indian Act, what happened with residential schools. Um, there's, a, there's a temptation right now to leave it to the media to do the telling of history. and. Uh, the, the narrative that the media gives us of residential schools has reversed the story, and the story needed to be shaken up deeply. Uh, but the academic community can't leave it to media outlets to, to be the, uh, the critical contributors to the telling of history. So there's a task for us. And I, I come back to this idea that the, uh, at the truth-telling gathering, a uh, wise survivor said, the truth will set you free, but half-truths, yeah, well, I think, let's finish that sentence, half-truths will not set you free. And, and we've been living with some half-truths, and, and now the media is giving us a narrative, which I think is not fully the truth. Um, and uh, so there's hard, critical work. I don't think the church's credibility in this conversation is taken seriously until we truly acknowledge uh, uh, that we shouldn't have been involved 
in this project of assimilation. When we truly acknowledge our mistakes and failings and apologize for them and commit to standing in solidarity. But I also don't think uh, that the narrative that everything that everybody did in a residential school was driven by an ill intent, intent to assimilate. Um, there's a more nuanced story out there and we hear it when we hear survivors speak. Uh, I heard a survivor speak two weeks ago who said, Father X was tall in stature and tall in compassion. Father Y was short in stature and very short in moral virtue. Um, so, I mean, I think the narrative is as complex as human beings who were involved and the motives that led them to be involved and the instructions they were, right? I, uh, so, I, I think it's the task of the academic community to work on that truth telling and that historical narrative, I bet you. Uh, no, I don't know where that slide was that I missed. Anyway, here's the slide to conclude with. Um, when Pope Francis uh, went to the Basilica in Quebec, uh, Cardinal Lacroix asked him to sign the guest book and to write something down. And uh, so this is uh, what he wrote. Marcher ensemble, ce n'est pas facile, mais c'est possible. It's not easy to walk together, but it is possible. And it is our responsibility and call. Okay, I'll leave it with that so that uh, I finish under the 50 minute mark and we can engage in some uh, discussion. I look forward to your, your comments and questions. Thank you, Archbishop Bolin, for those insightful remarks. Um, as is our custom at the Lectures in Catholic Experience, we do have some opportunity for anyone in the audience to ask questions. There are mics on each side of the room. So if you have a question for, uh, for Archbishop Bolin, please uh, line up at one of the mics and uh, we'll be glad to make time for those. Thank you, Archbishop, for visiting and having this illuminating discussion and more generally for your leadership and this important healing. Um, I'm, I, I'm curious if you could maybe talk a little bit more about the spiritual implications of this history. And I, I'm looking at some of the language, for example, in that March 2023 document, and I see language of errors and apology but not language that would seem to me more authentic to the church of sin and repentance. And so I, I'm curious why that language isn't there. Maybe that's just those excerpts. Maybe that language is elsewhere in that document. Um, but I, I wonder if the church would be trusted more and seen as more authentic if it used its spiritual language more strongly in some of these messages. Thank you. I think that's an excellent uh, point. I, I think that language exists in Pope Francis's addresses. Um, this is a the statement was put out by two dicasteries, and it it's written as a different kind of document at the specific request. But I think it certainly could have used that language of sin and repentance. Pope Francis certainly uses that language, and uh, acknowledges that popes also sin and that he also sins. Uh, I find that very liberating. Um, as soon as he became Pope, he talked about himself as a, as a sinner who God looked upon with mercy. So I, mean, I think that's very important language and it it's, creates more of a bridge or an openness uh, to be engaged with. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Archbishop, for being here tonight. And thanks for your um, your talk and for, for, for bringing some nuance to this whole discussion, which is very welcome, especially at an academic community. And so speaking to the notion of nuance, the one thing that I was hoping you would speak to is if, if indeed uh, your argument rests on the idea that the doctrine of discovery was not a doctrine in the, in the church's use of the word doctrine. But could you explain to us why is it called the Doctrine of Discovery? Where did that name come from? And how does that, um, and how, if, if we knew that, if we, if we understood the, the origins of that term, it might be easier 
for you to make the case that it's not a doctrine of mm -hmm. the church. Right. I think it's easier to make the case that it's not a doctrine of the church than it is to find out the historical origins of when it was yeah. first used, because I've been digging uh, on the internet, and, and uh, <clears throat> so I'm hoping that the symposium will be able to bring together scholars who are gonna be able to uh, dig out the origins of that phrase. Um, because the phrase doctrine of discovery is not yet in that 1823 ruling either. It's implicit there. It's, it's like the legal principle of discovery, um, but uh, it's, it's not referred to as a doctrine in that context. So I've, I've been looking and uh, my co-researcher mm -hmm. in this work has been, been looking. But I, I think it's, easier to say why it's not a church doctrine from the church's perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's because this kind of statement, this kind of papal bull was not a, a, a forum for communicating doctrine. Doctrine is generally about God, about human relationship with God. And uh, so this is, uh, these are statements that have a, a strong political character. And that's not to minimize them, No, right? It, these, these statements played a significant, had a significant impact, right? I don't, I don't want to minimize them in any way, uh, but... Could, could, the, as, if I, could the, sta the statement, so the papal bulls, which are papal letters, yep. if, you, if you could explain then perhaps to what extent could those statements, could those letters influence the actions of, of church officials or actions of, of members of the church in, in the sense that they, they might, could it be that they would perceive such letters as doctrine, even if they are not doctrine? I, I think you're, in response to the first part of your question, yes, those papal letters could have significant influence and could impact actions of peoples and nations. Uh, Canon probably did, mm -hmm. but that's, that's part of the work that needs to be done in the lead up to this symposium. And, uh, and um, could they be perceived as doctrine? I mean, sure, you ask your average Catholic on the street when he, he hears Pope Francis talk about anything at the Wednesday audience, uh, a person might have just said, well, the Catholic, you know, the Pope just gave us some new doctrine, but that, yeah. that, that's not what he's done. <laughs> right. and, and there are various, you know, kinds of papal documents, and there's various kinds of teaching. And uh, so I, from a theological perspective, I think it's, it's fairly clear from the Catholic Church's perspective, these were never doctrines, nor were statements that we might look at much more favorably today. The 1537 document is not right. doctrine either, although it yeah. does articulate a doctrine that every human being deserves dignity because they're created in the image and likeness of God. That's a doctrine. <laughs> no, well, thanks for making that distinction because I think yeah. that's so important. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I hope you're able to pursue that line of investigation yourself. Uh, Yes, thank you, uh, Archbishop, for uh, uh, making, you know, for bringing nuance to this uh, discussion. And I'm going to ask a question that I hope to el eliminate some of that nuance uh, <laughs> for us. Uh, and that is, I wonder if the focus on the papal bulls uh, is, is, is a dead end. That um, what about the broader impact of a Christian culture, especially the Christian culture of triumphalism? Mm -hmm. uh, what did the church do to promote, uh, defend, and expand the culture of empire and, and colonial uh, expansion? Right. Uh, the doctrine of discovery, I mean, you know, the, 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 the main points, I, I would look at it less as a formal document, doctrine of the church, obviously, mm -hmm. even a legal doctrine, yeah. but it does capture a, a kind of basket of assumptions, yes. uh, of racist assumptions and triumphalist assumptions about European Christian culture, uh, and that the church's real challenge is to overcome its ancient identification, going back to Constantine, right, uh, with uh, the political elite of, of its day. This is, I think, the more fruitful path to examine uh, 
because as you said, we're never going to find where this doctrine came from. But the, those attitudes, if I, if I were to look at this more from a sociological point of view uh, than a theological point of view, I think that's the culture that needs to be critiqued. Yes, I, I completely agree. Um, and, and you do hear Pope Francis specifically <laughs> challenging those cultural attitudes or those attitudes within the church regarding culture and suppression of cultures. And you hear him calling for a culture of encounter, a culture of dialogue. Um, but if one piece of this for the church is how it deals with its, the, the sins of its people in the past, you, uh, I think you expand the, the question in a, in a good and accurate way. Uh, so I, I appreciate that, and I think that, uh, so I think part of what the research still needs to do, because it does have implications even in terms of reparation, in terms of proper response or taking ownership, is to find out what we can about what the colonizing powers were discerning and thinking in their regard. But without doubt, the church communicated a uh, basically a blessing upon that European uh, uh, cultural uh, spread uh, as though it was unambiguously a good thing. Mm -hmm. it, it just seems to me that the focus on the, on the papal bulls may, um, may make the church appear defensive and, and narrow rather than yeah. broader and, and open to criticism. So. All, all these questions and comments are extremely helpful. I, I mean, I think we should be taking notes on them as well, because uh, that's good, good insights. Thank you. Hello, Bishop Bullen. Hello. Um, so you mentioned the joint statement asks for the church to participate, uh, pursue justice, and stand in solidarity with indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. And I know that this past week, the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops met for their annual plenary meeting. So I was wondering, did this week's meeting support our steps forward? on the long journey towards truth and reconciliation. And um, how are we, uh, as a Catholic church, engaging with indigenous populations across <coughs> Canada? Yeah, thank you. Those are big, big questions. Um, one of the things that Pope Francis said during his visit is that uh, while reconciliation is moved forward by large gestures, and I think he's referring to the papal visit in that instance so during the visit, uh, it moves forward most on the local level. Uh, and he's referring to a specific, he says this in a specific context in Edmonton, where people work together, where they listen to each other, where they heal each other's wounds, where they learn a good way of walking together. So I think a lot of the work that's going on right now is not about producing more documents or, or more statements. Um, in terms of the, the financial commitment of $30 million, it's really up to individual dioceses <coughs> to find ways to engage with First Nation, Métis, Inuit peoples and find uh, hopefully survivor-led initiatives that we can support as a way of standing in solidarity. I think it's the long haul work uh, to be supporting initiatives of indigenous language, culture, traditions. Uh, I think it's the long haul work to celebrate the indigenous view of creation and the created world. Uh, Pope Francis is often speaking about that. Uh, in Laudato Si, he said, whenever there's a major inter, you know, economic development, uh, indigenous people should be the principal interlocutors. Uh, he's always pointing to indigenous people as knowing how best to live on a land. And it, the, the, I mean, we're going to get a new document on October 4th, which is going to be an updating of Laudato Si uh, on the care of the earth and listening to the cry of the earth and the cry of the people, uh, the poor. And, you know, he's passionate that indigenous people have a wisdom that we all need to learn or else we're going to destroy ourselves. Uh, so I think those are areas of work and the ongoing finding ways to stand in solidarity in the pursuit of justice. So, I mean, I think it's on the agenda for every bishop in the country. Uh, hopefully it's on the agenda, you know, in, in regions and wherever we gather. It's certainly part of the agenda for the 
the committees that exist on a national level, the Canadian Catholic Indigenous Council and the Guadalupe Circle, um, to find ways to, to address those issues and to engage. It's on our horizon. Um, not everything that gets done is a, a news story or a, or a document, but I think we're working on it, I'm trying to listen and to be led by survivors when possible. All right, thank you. I lived on Treaty 4 for four years. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> uh, from t 2011 till 2015, when the TRC recommendations were brought forward. So not because of, however, my question is about the recommendations, not because I was living on Treaty 4 at that time, however, certainly impacted me and my family being there uh, during that key time in terms of self-determination of Indigenous peoples. 94 recommendations is a lot. And however, it's very important for Canadians to read and digest and process in as much as possible action. So what are your suggestions for going through the recommendations um, to, to us? And, you know, appreciating that it's, it's, a long, it's a long report, very important. However, 94 is a lot of recommendations. Yeah, thank you. It's a great question too. You know, so, I mean, the calls to action are really addressed to different categories of society. And uh, so it's not like you pick a random one. If you're a teacher, <laughs> look to the calls to action that are addressed to educators. Um, if you're a member of the clergy, um, look to the calls to action that are addressed to the churches. Um, and I'm just going to identify some of the calls to action that were addressed to the churches. That, and so we, we responded to papal visit the UN declaration uh, or call to action to support the UN declaration uh, but there's calls to action pertaining to cemeteries call to action 61 is one of the key ones that we're working with in finding projects that pertain to that come from that 30 million dollar fund which is uh, uh, support of language, support of culture, bringing together indigenous elders and youth so that those traditions and ways can be passed on uh, each capital city invited to build a monument to survivors. So, I, I mean, I think if you're working from a church perspective, uh, look to the calls to action to the churches. Uh, if you're in politics, then there's a different calls to action. I think, I, but I, I think it takes 10 minutes to read them all. <laughs> so it's not like it's gonna, you know, just expose yourself to the full range because there is such a, a large blueprint for transformation in those calls to action. Uh, one wise indigenous person I knew back in 2017 in Saskatoon when they came out said to a large group of Catholics, read them and pick one that you think you can do something about and, and work on that. Uh, don't, don't be overwhelmed. I remember in a conversation a few years ago where we had Nigan Sinclair as a guest speaker, uh, and I was a little discouraged at that point on call to action 58. He said, don't turn the calls to action into a checklist that you think that's over and done. You know, calls to action are an invitation to engagement. They're an invitation to transformation, to right relationships. View them in that way and see what step or steps you can take as a person, as a parish, as a community, as a family. Um, so I think that way you break it down and don't get too overwhelmed. Thank you. Hello, Archbishop, thank you for coming out. Um, I just have a question. The first question uh, that somebody brought up was about like spiritual kind of uh, talk mm -hmm. in the church, and you sort of mentioned that doctrine in the church is about God, about people's relationship with God. Mm. I'm just kind of wondering, like, as we walk forward in reconciliation and dialogue, like, what aspect do, does kind of spiritual dialogue take place? Like, because we talked mm. about, like, interfaith sort of dialogue. Beautiful. Like, how does that sort of relate to reconciliation? Because just this past Tuesday, we s celebrated the Feast of the Canadian Martyrs, and we see men like St. Jean de Brebeuf and St. Antoine de da uh, Daniel, like, they recognized within the Indigenous faith, like, similarities yes. with the Catholic faith of, like, belief with belief in a creator, interconnectedness of people, fraternity, etc. Like, yeah. so how does that sort of connect with our current engagement 
in reconciliation as a church because I think that's like really important. Yeah, I agree completely. I mean, one of the projects that I've had the privilege to work on for a little while is a, a dialogue with indigenous uh, spiritual leaders, elders, um, uh, about spirituality. And uh, it's really to try to help the church move past misunderstandings about indigenous uh, spiritual ways. Um, I think my encouragement, uh, and this is not a what to do as a universal church, right? But what to do as individuals. If you establish relationships with uh, indigenous peoples and they invite you to a ceremony, that's a real privilege and a possibility. And you're not compromising your Catholic faith by attending a, a powwow, by attending, a, by participating in a sweat lodge, you know? Um, it's a possibility of encounter and engagement in a respectful way um, that helps us to move past uh, false assumptions and to start to name some of that common ground that you identify as there. I was invited a few years ago to a Sundance and just for a day and really just to watch and <laughs> meet with the knowledge keeper. But I, I was struck by how that was a ceremony that church and society alike had said should be forbidden, you know, and and there was nothing there that felt like it should be forbidden, right? It, there was it was moving, and and it was uh, some, yeah. I don't want to say more about it except that I, I was a little bit ashamed of government and church response, and that there's a real richness indigenous spiritual practices and ways that we can learn from and that we do right to enter into dialogue uh, with it. So that's a, that's a starting point of an answer to your, your question, but I think it's, the, it's a great question to be asking um, by individuals and communities as we try to learn a good way to walk together. Thank you. Good evening, Archbishop. Um, this evening, there are several elementary teachers and secondary teachers here. Um, and so I'm thinking of um, moving forward with our curriculum. Um, could you speak briefly or at least point us uh, in a direction uh, about the relationship that the church had with the Canadian government? Because I think now we speak of church and government almost synonymously and or, or sometimes, sometimes. Um, um, but uh, specifically at the time of the Indian Act. And so wh why why the Catholic Church felt a responsibility uh, or a need for residential schools. Mm -hmm. um, so some, something to point to, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Let me start by just mentioning a book <laughs> that uh, uh, was put out by the Office of the Treaty Commissioner in Saskatchewan a few years ago. There's a, they produced a, a volume for each grade but the grade four volume, which I think any first year university student would have a nice challenging read with, <laughs> is called Treaty Elders of Saskatchewan. And it's a beautiful text, which is a series of interviews with, with elders uh, unpacking their, their teaching in a really beautiful way. I, I haven't quite figured out how grade fours can navigate it fully, but I maybe underestimate grade fours. Um, I certainly found it a wonderful challenge to read that. <laughs> um, so I, I think in uh, church and government, I mean, they were, they, they were no more intertwined in 1867 than they are today. <laughs> There's often opposition and tension. Uh, but the government policy of assimilation, uh, the policy of separating indigenous children from their families that church supported to the extent it did because it wrongly and sinfully right, thought that becoming European or living a European lifestyle with European values uh, was better, was the Christian way, was uh, advanced, and uh, Pope Francis calls that 
arrogant and that we should never, ever do that again, right? So, uh, I mean, the church's solidarity or, or support for uh, government policies that in our eyes today are very wrong uh, is what we're dealing with as a legacy here or a big part of what we're dealing with. But I, I think there were heavy conflicts between church and government already then, and I don't think they easily should be put together. <laughs> so, okay. Thank you. Thanks. Good luck with your teaching. Hello, um, thank you so much for your remarks tonight. Um, I'm just wondering, as a Catholic church and as a worldwide group of Christians in general, mm -hmm. when we think about not only the impact of things like the papal bulls um, and that sort of idea of colonialism, um, do you think that it might be important to dig further back into our history even further than Constantine and reckon with some of the scriptural depictions of imperial violence and how we have um, conceptualized those narratives as a church. I am shamelessly pulling this from a class I'm in right now. Very good. Yeah. Um, but one example uh, that I just read about in a paper is the way in which we conceptualize the Canaanites in the story of the Exodus and the, them as kind of colonized peoples and how we don't usually think about that or talk about that. Do you think that that can or should be part of this conversation? Thanks very much. Uh, even if it comes from a class, it's a very good question. Although I think we need some rabbis here to engage in that <laughs> Hebrew Bible part of that. I, I mean, I think scripture scholarship at its best understands the scriptures as sh telling us something about God and how we're called to ask act, uh, but we're also called to study the scriptures in terms of their historical contexts and to ask the kind of difficult question that you're asking and to say, from a Christological perspective, what we know about God through Jesus, you know, where do we see God present in that? And that's a, that brings us into more complicated territory. I remember once coming home from the Easter Vigil with my niece who maybe was 13 or 14 at the time and hearing the, the reading from Exodus and she was just mortified, <laughs> you know, that, that uh, God would want all those Egyptians to drown. And I thought, good work, niece. <laughs> you keep asking good questions, you know. Um, so, I mean, I think we're called to read the scriptures in a critical and responsible way to look for the voice of God in it, but, but there's some human <laughs> engagement and there's a real historical context, which is sometimes complex in which those texts are written. So good luck with your studies. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. It is possible to hold faith and rigorous critical thinking together. <laughs> uh, again, thank you for, for being here tonight. I've certainly learned a lot and I'm not a member of the Catholic Church, so a lot of this has been very educational for me. My questions, I've got a few of them sort of all compounded, but what, I guess, what is the average indigenous person on the street? How are they reacting to your, your um, the, you know, the, the bishop's statements and the, um, the documents that have come out? Uh, what are their expectations? Um, how, how are they digesting all of this? And yeah. you know, whether it's the groups you're working with, or as I said, the man on the street. Um, yeah. To me, it's it's like it's one thing to sort of talk and have great documents, but mm. how are they receiving it? And I guess that's my question. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Very. Okay, another great question. And people sitting in the front row who could probably answer that more accurately than I. I Archbishop uh, Smith went to meet with some of his indigenous leaders um, when we were working on a pastoral letter and saying, how does this sound to you? And they told him, Bishop, the letter we want is you, <laughs> not another text, not another letter. <laughs> we want you to become engaged. You, you know, we want you to show up at things. And I, I think that would be pretty, I mean, 
know that there is an average anybody on the street, but I think the world, the broken, wounded, and struggling world, indigenous and not indigenous, is not waiting for more documents. <laughs> it's, it's waiting for compassion, mercy, solidarity, and the pursuit of justice, uh, community, <laughs> friendship, non-judgmental attitude, accompaniment. Uh, that's what people are yearning for uh, across the board, I think. And uh, at the same time, documents do guide us. And there are times when documents need to be produced in order to address problematic situations. And I think the March 30th document is one of those. But I don't expect that a person an indigenous person that I'm going to meet on the street in Victoria Avenue in Regina is going to have any <laughs> inkling about that document. And if they read it, that it would matter too much to them. There are many that have been calling for this uh, addressing of the, the papal bulls, but, but that's not the most fundamental thing people are looking for. I don't know, I see some nodding there. Am I on the right track? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Actually, I, I've got two questions, if that's okay. <laughs> but, uh, Weave them into one big sentence. <laughs> might get away with it. <laughs> with uh, some of the research I've done over the years, I'll never forget when the Jesuits came to Canada, the kind of working theory was extra ecclesiam nulla salus. And outside the church, there's no salvation. And I've never forgotten that, and I've looked for examples of the church reaching out to other religions and seeing their possibilities. And in particular, when, when I, well, a couple of things, I guess. One of them is, um, I, I remember being in New York, going to Mass on Sunday in a cathedral. And I had another prof with me, and, uh, we thought it was a Catholic church, and we went in, and there's a woman at the back dressed in a chasuble. And uh, I said, you know, <laughs> this is not a Catholic church. <laughs> this is an Anglican church, as it was. And she, it turned out, was a professor of homiletics. And she gave a homily like I've never heard a man give. <laughs> I mean, she was very, very good. And... <sighs> When, when I look at uh, things that have happened in, in the recent uh, times, uh, one of them is there were uh, changes made in some of the structures of the church recently. And we had the discussion of them at Mass here. And after that, a couple of my students said, they're women. That's it for me. I'm going and I'm never coming back. And I have to wonder what we're doing if we're trying to integrate with other religions. What are we doing to make women feel like part of our religion? Mm. Because, <laughs> I mean, when you talk about the discussions that have been taking place in Rome, and, you know, I mean, I have uh, been involved in discussions with very senior uh, Catholic, um, well, <laughs> very senior Catholics. <laughs> <laughs> and I've read their documents, and I find that the, uh, there, there's a tendency to write about Christ, and there's a tendency to say that Jesus is the background for everything. And in the discussions, you're eliminating the role of women in the church. Mm. And so I wonder, you know, we're talking about the future of the church. How do you put all that together? Right. That's a pretty good question. <laughs> Let me say that Pope Francis is encouraging, uh, he's certainly not encouraging, encouraging the marginalization of women or the suppression of women voices. Um, women have positions of leadership now at the Holy See that they haven't had before. Uh, my friend Kathy Clifford is on her way to the Synod uh, as a participant, a theologian in Ottawa. 
Um, so I think Pope Francis's vision is one that the church needs to be engaging in dialogue, to be having rigorous, deep, and honest conversations to discern the movement of the Holy Spirit going forward. And he certainly sees that women need to be a part of those conversations, not marginalized or separated from them. Um, so, I, yeah, I, and in 1949, I think a, a priest in Boston named Feeney got really into big trouble by arguing extra ecclesium nulla salus. So we did let that one go. <laughs> and at the Second Vatican Council, the church called for dialogue, not only with other Christian communities, but with other religious traditions and talked about seeking the good in them and looking for the common good that we can do together. So we are moving. Uh, I haven't really noticed it. <laughs> I haven't really noticed. Well, <laughs> I had another comment. It, it's question, out there. But I, I won't bother you. Uh, bring us to a close with uh, one announcement or reminder and four thank yous. So in terms of announcement or reminder, uh, tomorrow the University of Waterloo will observe uh, the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. There are a number of events that have been planned on campus with the support of the Office of Indigenous Relations, the first of which is a 7 a.m. sunrise ceremony. So if you somehow miss the details of those events, I would encourage you to go to the University of Waterloo's website and find out more about what's happening happening tomorrow on campus. Four thank yous. So the first thank you uh, to Jamie Phillip and her team in marketing and communications who do all of the event support um, at St. Jerome's. Among the things that we're grateful that they have done for us tonight is put together a card uh, that lists the rest of the lectures of Catholic in Catholic experience for, um, for this year. So if you didn't uh, get a card on the way in, please do find some on your way out and we hope to see you again at a future lecture. Uh, second thank you is to uh, the wonderful IT staff um, here at St. Jerome's. They have live streamed tonight's event, but they've also recorded it. So if you have anyone in your life who would be um, interested in tonight's lecture but wasn't able to make it tonight, uh, you'll find that recording um, on our website. A uh, third thank you to uh, Dana Hospitality. They are our food and beverage partner here at the university. Uh, they provided all of tonight's drinks and snacks, and we certainly hope that um, you'll continue the conversation amongst each other um, and with Archbishop Bolin. Um, grab a snack, grab some tea on your way out this evening. Uh, and then finally, thank you, Archbishop Bolin, for the great um, lecture and also for your engagement with um, all of the wonderful audience questions. So mm. thank you. Thank you.